He's black guy, Fox. And I am a man of constant sorrow. And together we are Fox and Friends. Today, the third friend who we are talking to about creativity and social justice is all white tail. Welcome back to your show. I know you have some exciting new announcements that we need to throw out there. So tell me a little bit about what you have going on in Pittsburgh. I'm really excited to announce that March 23rd, I will be opening up for Dave Haas at the Thunderbird Cafe. I'm extremely happy for the show. I've been a fan of Dave Haas for a while now. Tickets are incredibly low. So get yours as soon as you possibly can. If you're in the Pittsburgh area or general area of Pennsylvania or Maryland, Get your tickets now and come hang out. It's going to be a fun time. If you come early or late, you might run into both Ian and I together somewhere. Who knows? So today we're talking to Old Whitetail. You guys have a really cool thing in common where I've seen both of you open for the Violent Femmes. And we all got to meet and hang out down in Frostburg, Maryland not too long ago. I think I've discovered her through you. And it was a really fun interview. I'm really excited to have her on the show today. Joining us today is Old White Tail. How are you doing today? Welcome to Fox and Friends. Good, how are you? Doing pretty good. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Of course. I have a question actually for both of you guys, since you both have a unique experience that you have done. You guys have both opened for the Violent Femmes. I'm just curious how both of you got that and uh, what that experience was like. I have no idea how I got it. No idea? There's like a booking company here in Pittsburgh that I play shows through them sometimes. And someone from them just emailed me and asked me if I would be interested in opening for the Violet Fans. What's it on? Opus One? Yep. I know. And I, I know I know Dave Romano. He, he's good people. Yeah. I mean, it was cool. I just have no idea how they chose me. And what about you, Ian? So I, I got mine kind of through my label. Ian does a production company in New Haven, Connecticut, but... He lobbied hard for me to play open up for that show for the 20th anniversary. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. I found out that like the second day I was in LA, I'm like, oh shit, things are, this is going to be awesome. Then I, well, but see, they, a few weeks after that, I found myself in New York, Connecticut, just in front of 2,300 people with the Violent Femmes. I want to know, how was your interaction with them? It was cool. I really like didn't know what they looked like or anything. <laughs> so... I just made guesses, but yeah, they were, I just like went to my, they have dressing rooms there and I just went to mine to eat a spring roll from the dollar store. (laughs) 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 And then someone like came to the door and was like, oh, they want to meet you. (laughs) That is cool. That's actually the show that I found your music in the first place because I was at that show. How was the response from the crowd, like when you guys were working the merch table and all of that? Mine was interesting. It, I think a lot of people didn't see my set because they were still waiting in line. <laughs> yeah, for me, I got I got a, a good bit of reaction. Like there's, I never had this happen before, except for like twice. But somebody asked my set list after after my set was over, and I found that was really cool. Then I left this note on the bottom of my set where anybody that wanted to grab it, just in case. That just said, if you if you ever see this and you're reading it. I'm glad you're still here. By the way, you get a free vinyl, so come be on my merch table. And they didn't read that. They just walked over to come talk to me. And then I just showed the bottom of them. They they smiled, they cried a little bit, and then we got to put folk together. So it was it was a it was a good reaction. The granite, that that being said, I thought that I was gonna be set up right next to the giant merch setup. But he sucked me in this really dark corner. And I, I had like only like one light that we could use because my friend MJ Bones, shout out. Who was just on the show? She was running the merch stamp table for me, and people were getting mad because the light that she had was just shot people in their eyes. And I'm just like, it, I can't sell merch. People can't see what I have unless there's no light. So just shut up. So I was just sort of, but it was it was a lot of fun though. I forgot what it, what the events looked like too. I just saw Gordon Gano come out 
walk out of this green room and just wear like this silk kimono and his hair pull back in a ponytail. I'm like, what? Who, who's who's auntie is this? I think that's a cool thing that you guys both have. Was that the biggest crowd that you had both performed for then? I I would say yes. That, again, that, that was like 2,300 people in, in College, College Street Music Hall, which you're also at too. Yeah, I don't know how many people were actually like in the auditorium when I played. But it was a good, it was like a pretty big crowd. It was a sold out show. And I think that the biggest crowd I ever sang for though is at Groundhog Day. Wait, so you, did you actually perform at Gobbler's Knob then? Yeah, I sang the national anthem. When it was huge. There were like a lot of people. So I think that was probably the biggest one. Was that in the days where they still partied and drank there? Because I think mm-hmm. they stopped doing that, right? I stopped going, so probably. <laughs> what was Gobbler's Knob? Now now I have so many questions now about these so, concerts. So Gobbler's Knob is the area just, I don't know if it's technically in or outside of Punxsutawney, but that's where they do the Groundhog Day uh, stuff, where the rodent sees his shadow, and then tells us if we're going to have an early spring or six more weeks of winter because rodents can't read calendars and don't understand things like equinoxes or months or weeks. So regardless, we still have spring six weeks after he looks at his shadow or doesn't anyway, because that's how because that's how calendars work. Listen, man, blame the Germans. They, they started that like they actually just start start that. I believe. Probably so. I feel like I learned the history of it when I was in high school, but I don't remember. I thought that it had to do with eating the groundhog. That's why I was gobbler. Like, go- <laughs> oh, you got dark real quick here. <laughs> uh, you know, so you grew up out that way, but you've kind of been all over. Like, where has moving and travel and music taken you? I lived just outside of Nashville, Tennessee for about seven years in a place called Murfreesboro. And I went to college there. And then um, while I was there, I did like I lived out in the country in Tennessee, too, in Bell Buckle for a couple of years. And then I moved to Halifax, Nova Scotia for three years and then Winnipeg, Manitoba for three years. And then I moved to Nashville for about 16 months before I moved to Pittsburgh. And now I'm in Pittsburgh. I've been here for five years now. What's your experience in Manitoba and and in Canada? I I loved Manitoba. I really like Canada a lot, but Manitoba was like what I expected Canada to be like. It was like tons of snow. And it was so cold, and it was like winter for six months, and and then like the summers are just the days are super long. It's still bright at ten thirty at night, and it's just like it's what I thought Canada would be like. And Halifax is really cute, cool, but it has like more of that like European, Scottish. It almost feels like you're in Europe a little bit. So it wasn't like, I don't know, Canada. <laughs> That's not what I was expecting. But I'm also be heading back to Montreal and make Pusa Fest, which I am extremely excited about. But I, I, now I'm curious just because I, I had some bad experiences there ish. What was your experience in Nashville? I would say like equal, equally good, equally bad experience there. I I ended up when I was in Nashville, actually just like getting more into jazz. And I like don't really like the music industry. And so being, I don't know, like being in Nashville made me dislike it more. And I feel like I met a lot of people who were like the typical self-absorbed artist once, you know, wants to be famous, whatever. But then I met people who also were like very sweet and want to be famous. And I like I'm I worked with one woman who is like a pop country star now. And she was cool. And she's still cool. And like I it made that made me like not dislike the industry as much. And I'm like, okay, you know, she's a real person and she's cool. But then then I just also met like you know shitty people. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like everywhere, you know? So I don't know. I would say that Nashville was the same experience I've had anywhere. And I, and I do like have probably more of a positive feeling towards Nashville than negative. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, Nat, Nashville, I know people back then used to say that you want to go to do music, go to Nashville and, and work out there. But I, I feel like 
maybe back then it probably maybe would have worked, but also it's just it's just extremely competitive there. I feel like we're at a point now where we, thanks to streaming and just thanks to the internet, you can just, I feel like you could be anywhere and and make music. You know, I've moved to one area per se just to just to start a career. Do you do you think that do you think that as well? Yeah, I that's like pretty much why I moved to Pittsburgh. It was like I don't I don't have the I guess social stamina to go out every night and network and play gigs and in Nashville is so expensive now. Like I I couldn't do that and work two jobs and like try to play music, but I could come to Pittsburgh and basically decide which gigs I want to say yes to and you know just have a normal life but I really miss the music the musicians in Nashville because it's just like everybody is a musician there I found for the most part a lot of support in Nashville now Ian I was thinking that maybe you had a different reason for not liking Nashville and uh, I was going to address that elephant in the room um how did did race play a, a factor down there for you it didn't I was only in Nashville for like maybe like the day while while I was on tour, but I didn't I didn't stick around that much. But I want to have that I guess that touristy commercial district where you see everybody wearing cowboy hats or or um, DC Dukes and like and cowboy boots and stuff like that. And it was just as soon as I saw that, like one every five every five feet, I got so annoyed. I'm like, pick a personality, please. But yeah. I also I also went to this one spot. In his, I guess it was in a shopping center or something like that for a hot chicken sandwich. That woman one so bad. And they said, well, it'll be like a half hour. It took an hour and a half for just, just, for, just for me to get it. And even then, it was, it was mediocre. So my, mine is more of it, just more for a, per, a personal annoyance than, than anything. Gotcha. But yeah. And I would say, like, all like those things too, those are the sort of like tourist trappy things that, if you live in Nashville, it like every person I know who lives in Nashville is also would say the same thing you just said about it. I think like if you were, if you lived there and got to know people, it it takes like one week to get to know people. Like it, it is a very supportive like community of musicians. If you're there, yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that at all. Like my one of my good friends, some Mark Robert Cash, he lives he lives down there, and he is also he's a he's a black country artist. Um, doing this own thing, I'm proud of them for it. So I know, I know there there's some good po- there have been some good pockets there. Just my experience on that horse trap district just haunt me. But now, now I have to ask, what is the best hot chicken sandwich in Nashville? Princess, but I don't think they're open anymore. I think they, I think they closed down. Damn. Yeah. Mister Shoddy, and I'm also like a vegetarian, so I don't know. And that's just what everyone else. That's fair. So I, one thing I am curious on, though, who are your musical influences? And, and what is your process of, of, of like writing? I always say for musical influences, who I listened to when I was a kid, because that's just what is still there, you know? And I, I listened to Dolly Parton a lot and Patsy Cline. And then I just like... I think when I was a teenager, I just got into like anything the 60s, like psychedelic music. And that's pretty much, you know, the the roots of it for me. Um, And then I I got involved in folk music and old time music and all of that. And I just I guess I just like kind of pull all of that in every once in a while. I love the Peabot Blues. That's like my biggest, I would say biggest like non childhood influence. But just like the roots of it are like I listened to Dolly and Patsy Cline all the time when I was a kid. So <laughs> I can I can hear that influence in your music and that makes sense to me. Something I want to ask both of you also, talking about influences and you know what you grew up with and where you grew up and where you where you choose to live. You guys uh, both describe yourselves as Appalachian in relate to your music. What does that mean for you guys? Because I'm sure it's slightly different for both of you. And uh, what does that mean in terms of your music? I put Appalachian folk on because I do live in the Appalachian region. And I do feel like being around, when I think of Appalachia, I, I always think of community. I always think about people look, looking out for one another. I always think about, bring, about finding ways to bring people together via music, 
or just any sort of culture. So that part of Appalachia has always just been part part of me. And that's why I feel like I, it has a lot of influence on what I sing about and how I interact with people. So that's like the Appalachian, Appalachian part. The folk punk part is because I'm a degenerate. So, it, man, I, and I bring, have a community of degenerates. What about you? What do you think? It's recent for me to consider myself Appalachian. And that comes from when I lived in Canada and somebody referred to me as Appalachian. And I was like, what? But I always associated, which I think is like normal and what most people associate Appalachian music with is just like a bunch of white people on the porch singing hillbilly stuff and Southern, like, you know, like Southern yeah. subjects and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to want to do that. But I mean, if you like think about it, it's just Appalachian. It's like where you're from and singing about where you're from and you, anything that you grew up with or that you deal with is Appalachian because that's where you are. And so I I don't know, I try to like subtly challenge the Appalachian stereotype by writing about I did grow up like rural hillbilly, you know, but I don't I don't want to like embrace that stereotype and write about it. Most of my newer influences, like I said, like the Piedmont blues are like it's black music. And it's Appalachian. So like I I don't know I it's hard to like get all into the details of that whenever I'm just trying to describe my genre but that's why I use Appalachian and I, I sometimes don't say folk class, I'm sorry sometimes say blues whatever but yeah how did you get into the blues was that did you say that was it like you found that in Nashville or was that something that you picked up somewhere else along the way I'd say it started when I was like getting into the 60s and like psychedelic stuff I like loved Janis Joplin. Again, I grew up in Punxsutawney and it's like all white influence of <laughs> anything. But Janice is, uh, I believe, was either Memphis Minnie or Sister Rosetta. I think it was Memphis Minnie. Sister Rosetta. It was Sister Rosetta. Yeah. And like, I remember looking her up and I was like, oh shit, this is awesome. And then when I was in Murfreesboro, I started to try to play like, old time or something i don't know how i i, I any however i found lead belly i found lead belly and i was like oh my god this is awesome and then that was like the end of it and i just like found as much blues as i could listen to and tried to learn how to play it etta baker is like my all-time favorite guitar picker and he you, you mentioned lead belly this it, it, is it, just a random topic but I, I didn't realize that he did record a song for black betty well oh, oh black Betty. i didn't realize it was like like a hymnal that was a slave tune and blew me away. Anytime I hear a history of songs like that, that makes so much, like that just sounds <laughs> about right. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh my gosh, of course. There's a lot of, I guess, like lost history when it comes to that music, but also it's, I don't want to say lost, it's just all like by word of mouth, right? Like it's not written down, which total side note, one of my favorite musicians Dom Flemons has a song called Nobody Wrote It Down. It's awesome. You should check it out. <laughs> Love Dom Flemons. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I spoke to him briefly. He played here on Frostburg once like, before a show. And it was so captivating. Just, just so good. I feel like when he plays the quills and then the banjo, I just like, I could just sit there for three hours and not realize I was there for that long so good he's doing a really cool thing just like doing as much as possible as figuring out what actually happened <laughs> sharing it outside of writing music else outside and playing i know you also write poetry as well how um, how early work did you get into poetry how long you been writing for i was writing poems when i was a little kid who long who do you look up to as, as a poet I would say that I I don't, I don't like, and I wouldn't, see, this is where I would say that I'm like a folk, like if, like in the genres of music that I'm like folk punk, I don't know. I don't listen. I don't like, it's just like whatever for poetry for me. I don't, you know, like I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and read poetry books, but I've read like Patti Smith, like her poems are cool. But yeah, I guess I don't want to, I don't want to 
I don't want anyone to think I'm like really a great poet or anything like that. <laughs> or that I know anything about what I'm doing when it comes to poetry. But. Says the one person on this call who has published a book of lyrics and poems. <laughs> you talk about doing that ever since you were a little kid. Is there any chance we can hear a little bye bye choo choo? Oh my God. Yeah, no, it was just bye. It was, it was just bye bye choo choo. That was all. <laughs> I should probably explain that for anybody who hasn't uh, read Her Shadow and the Blossoms. That was the first song that Old Whitetail uh, wrote, according to the introduction to that book. Oh, and apparently, my aunt told me that we were in a. Um... Like in one of the really small little diners of Pennsylvania, and the election was on, which would have been in the like eighties. So it, was it Reagan? I don't know. I don't know who it was. I think it was Reagan that was replaced. But apparently, the election was on TV, and I just started singing "Bye Bye Reagan," and everybody <laughs> started laughing. But I don't remember that. I was I would have been like three, two or three. <laughs> and then a, lot of us, a lot of us sang that a different way uh a couple of years later um right <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll sing it now <laughs> now in terms of like playing music and gigging don't you also play with a mariachi band i used to how did you get into that I do genuinely like folk music, like from all around the world. Like I love learning about different kinds of music and I really like mariachi. Um, and they were auditioning and I had lost, I had like been fired from a job. It was actually like a layoff. It's a long story, but I was kind of just like pissed off and like, I don't want to have a normal job anymore. Like I don't trust it. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to audition with mariachi band, you know? Yeah, I mean, long story short, I played with them for a couple months. And then I had a health thing happen with... Now, I know it was a migraine, but they thought it was a stroke at the hospital. And they, like, they told me that I had a hemorrhage. And it was, like, all this crazy stuff. But they also told me that I couldn't play... I shouldn't play in the mariachi band anymore because it, like, involved being outside in the heat wearing this really big <laughs> hot outfit. And that that was, like causing me to have a migraine so i was like a mariachi for about two months and then i just like physically couldn't handle it <laughs> wow i <laughs> at least you can laugh about it now oh yeah it was kind of crazy it was very crazy at the time and it's kind of a bummer because i like i like the music and everything but i still have a vihuela i learned how to play vihuela for, for the mariachi band so which is a very, I think, folk punk instrument. What's the name of it again? Vihuela. I actually have no idea what that is. I won't even try to front. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have no idea. Like, what? 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 It's like a mini guitar. Okay. It just tuned almost the same. There's only five strings on it, and you just like pound on it, like strum hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's. I mean, how many instruments can you play? I can play the guitar, and then I play the banjo like guitar, and then mandolin, and then I kind of sometimes play ukulele and clarinet and bass. The clar I'm, I'm curious about the clarinet because everything else there had strings. It's probably my favorite instrument, and I just bought myself one right before right before COVID. Actually, like I didn't know COVID was coming. And I bought a clarinet just to, like, let myself play with, you know, like, try to play it. And then COVID hit and I learned how to play a little bit. I'm not good at it, though. Like, I'm not good at it. It's just, like, my fun instrument. I feel it, a fun instrument. Bust out of parties. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Zayu, that's what I really get at. <laughs> I'm going to the wrong parties. I need to go to a party where somebody busts out a clarinet. And, and a kazoo. A kazoo. Yeah. You can play anything on a kazoo. It's true. <laughs> uh, okay. It's true. I'm just a kid and life is a nightmare. You are just a kid and life is a nightmare. You are the baby. You're the baby. Are you the baby? He's the baby. Of how many? I just like to remind him how much older I am. Because he makes me feel sad sometimes, like by telling me what albums came out the year he was born. 
and then I just go cry in the bathtub what? for a while. Wait, what album came out? Dookie. Dookie Three by Dookie. Dookie. August and Everything After, Counting Crows. Do you know what song was number one when you were born? I do. I do too. I just recently found out. Mine is a bop, but it's also fucking terrible. But it, when, when, when you listen to the song in context, but is My Sharona by The Knack. Ooh, it makes my motor run. It's paying to run. <laughs> uh, paying to um, pedophilia. <sighs> Sigh. Mine is Like a Virgin by Madonna. <laughs> so the thing I do at karaoke bars when somebody's birthday it is, I don't buy strangers drinks because that's weird and creepy. But if it's like somebody's like doing the big birthday thing, I'm like, hey, here's a slip with my name on it. Why don't you just write a random song? And that's what I'll sing instead of anything I would have picked. And Like a Virgin gets done so often that I'm just like, can you try really? to embarrass me a different way? Like, like I, this, I mean, nothing's going to, the secret is nothing's going to embarrass me. But like, I'm just, I get tired of doing that. <laughs> or man, I feel like a woman. Like those are the two that everyone goes to. And I'm like, I pass for straight better than I realized. I tried to sing Ace of Base at karaoke one time. Like, I saw the sign. Mm -hmm. That song is so, so high. Like, I could not sing at all. See, I'm someone who really doesn't know shit about music, so I'm surprised because I've heard you sing, and I feel like you do have a higher voice when you I sing. I thought so, too. That's why I picked it. I was like, oh, I'll sing this. It's going to sound great. And it was <laughs> so good. <laughs> The the number one song when when I was when I was born was "Weak" by SWV. Sisters with voices, nice. Where where was I when that came out? I don't even know what that song is. God, I'm young. Was I in Canada? My guess is you were in middle school to early high school in Punxsutawney, which is why you didn't know SWV. <laughs> So, my buddy who's a who's a phd is focused on african-american literature was from punxsutawney and i think he said that he met the, the very first black person he met was when he was in undergrad that makes sense i played basketball i was on the basketball team so you got out a little bit of jefferson county right right and we like did travel like i was on the travel league so <laughs> we did a tournaments and stuff but still and is it racist if I ask you if you played basketball? We know you didn't. Spud white looking motherfucker. I did. For a short period of time, I, I played basketball, soccer, and I played karate. You well, played karate? I, yes, I, I, I played the karate, if you will. <laughs> I played karate, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, I, played, I played the karate. The karate. Oh, God. We're off the rails here. And this I played that. Sword. I played sword fighting for a little while. No, no I took I took um German long sword for a little oh, while. Oh shit! Yeah, I have it still. My sword and my gloves. <laughs> it hurts. It does hurt when you get hit with it. Well, I mean, if it's an actual sword, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that you talk about a lot is the importance of public transportation and not giving into like highway culture. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, first I. I chose to not have a car for environmental reasons. And then it turned into financial reasons. And I just have noted, like, the biggest thing I notice when I walk to work or bike to work or take a bus to work or whatever is that, that people, the first, like, reaction I get from people is, how do you do it? You know, oh my gosh, how do you do that? How do you live without a car? And then, like, within... Two minutes, they'll also say, how are you so happy all the time? And I 100% think it's related. I am fortunate that I can, like, get around on my two feet. You know, I can get around if I need to. I can walk. I can bike. But the biggest thing I notice when I'm on buses is people don't have cars and they need to get around. A lot of times there's... It appears to be single moms with kids, kids <laughs> getting on the bus, older people who maybe aren't allowed to drive anymore or can't, people with disabilities need the bus to get around. And they're usually just full. Like, you know, like anytime I get on a bus, it's full of people that 
that need it to get from one place to the other. And I don't know, I guess I just, it seems like all the reasons, I mean, all the reasons that people have for not using public transit are legitimate because it is very challenging, but you can do it if you have to. <laughs> how is Pittsburgh as a walkable city or a mass transit city? Like, how does it, how does it rank up there? I would say it's better. It's better than anywhere I've lived. As far as actually like options for taking the bus places, it takes forever a lot of times. Um, but the busway is awesome. And if you can take the busway to get somewhere, because that, and this is where I like, am such an advocate for just bus lanes only. Busway in Pittsburgh is four buses only. And if you get on the bus, you can get from one side of town to the next in like 15 minutes. No traffic. It's awesome. There's like three stops because it's, you know, Speedy. Um, there's trains here. I mean, this city could do better in making safe bus stops. Some of them are just bus stops on the side of the road with no sidewalk. And also just in making the sidewalk accessible. Again, I can do it because if I need to walk around a car that's parked on the sidewalk, I can. But somebody in a wheelchair can't do that. And for biking, it's nice because there's a lot of bike lanes and trails, but it's awful to try to bike or even walk with traffic in Pittsburgh because the drivers are <laughs> like there is no like pedestrian has the right of way here. Now it's that time that we hit you with our, our rapid fire questions. One, two, three, four. Five, motherfucker. All right. Give me your Mount Rushmore of so 60s artists. You mean what? Oh, Mount Rushmore. The four that you enshrine in stolen stone. And from the 60s. Yes. See, now I don't know if people are the 60s or the 70s. Let's pick 60s and 70s artists. That, that you might wish more of. Okay. Alice Coltrane. Um, Dolly Parton. Nina Simone. And John Denver. Okay. <laughs> Mount Rushmore of like cool hidden Pittsburgh. Cool hidden Pittsburgh? Yeah, like stuff that's that maybe like somebody might not know if they're somewhat familiar with Pittsburgh. But not people. Yeah. Um, the steps, the Pittsburgh steps. Great Allegheny Passage. And all the libraries. And the uh the busway. What are your music guilty pleasures? Guilty? Yeah. What? Or what would commonly be defined as a guilty pleasure? You do not actually have to feel guilt for liking what you okay. like. Okay. Um, risque. <laughs> and maybe Shakira. I can, get, I can get behind Shakira. Yeah. I know. I don't, I'm not really like guilty for either of them, but. So you said you, you said you fell in love with jazz. You're Mount Rushmore of jazz artists. Jazz artists. Okay. Well, that's Alice Coltrane again. Dorothy Ashby. Clifford Brown and Max Roach. Nice. Yeah. Old Whitetail, you survived. Surprise, motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, but now, now is the chance to talk about anything that you have coming up, places where people can find you, where they can buy your music, buy your book. Cool. Band is where I have my book and music, and it's the only place you can buy the book uh, online. Or you can just send me a message in Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> my music's on Bandcamp as well, or like, the other streaming places and i'm playing a songwriter showcase on march 23rd at the first unitarian church in pittsburgh with liz mcbride lenny green and lily castle and then after that i there's some things i'm playing at settler's cabin which is in carnegie june 19th june t oh damn it yeah that means I'm going to miss some really good stuff going on. Very cool. Well, thank yeah. you so much for coming on and talking to us. Mm -hmm. yeah, th thank you for this. this. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me. I now know what a Mount Not Rushmore is. This show is the brainchild of Black Guy Fox, folk punk Rio. You can find him on all the social medias as Black Guy Fox or Black Guy Fox Music as well as on his website, blackguyfox.com. 
The intro and outro are both from the song New American Meltdown by Black Guy Fox. So that's legally covered because this is his podcast. And that is his song available on the album Life, Love, and the Bomb. Additional music elements provided by Fab Shop Music, a royalty-free music subscription service for podcast hosts and YouTube creators. More info at fabshopmusic.com. Sound design and editing by Ed Cunard, who appears courtesy of his dog and many, many cats. Cover art by Jacob Matthews, a pal who has been down since day one. Fox and Friends is hosted on Spotify for podcasters. Listen on Spotify for the best experience. Finally, while Fox and Friends firmly believes that punk rock is and should be a safe space, we know it can't be safe for everyone without excluding bad elements. So remember, remember. So tell your local Nazis that the fascists to fuck off. Real legit, my phone is dying. I'm trying, turning off my camera, plugging in my phone. Okay. Tired of yeah. looking at you anyway. That's, that's, <laughs> my, mom, my mom says the same thing, so it's fine.